You know those moments when you're doing what you love in your business? Maybe it's standing on stage or creating content. Whatever it is, you're totally immersed and time just seems to slip by. This is called the flow state. At SpeakerFlow, we're obsessed with how to get you there more often. Each week, we're joined by a new expert where we share stories, strategies, and systems to help craft a business you love. Welcome to Technically Speaking. Look at us. Boom. We did it. We're live. We're here. Hello, Dean, welcome to the show. Hi. So- Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I like all of the plants that you've got in your background. Taylor and I were just having a conversation the other day about how my office feels very clinical, like I'm in a hospital. <laughs> Need more like like life around me, light yeah. the place up a little bit. And I feel like you started giving me a visual idea of what I could do. <laughs> So thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> you're, you're so welcome. It looks like you did add some greenery in your background. So a touch, I, nice touch. But I can see how without that, it would definitely look like a hospital room. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna need a <laughs> lot. Check out the of video, folks. To feel real Austin about, about the hospital room. room so <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I, I'll cry later. <laughs> uh, man. We're, we're honored to have you. You know, uh, we, as as our listeners know, we do a little digging on our guests before uh, the show begins. Uh, good research makes for good episodes, generally speaking. Um, and, you know, everybody, I think, in the professional world, at least that's been around for a while, gets like an award or two now and again, you know, like... Uh, and that's an exciting thing. I'm not disparaging awards, okay? But uh, you have a very special award. I think you were awarded like, what, top 100 entrepreneurs under 30 or something from the UN? The United, like the, like, yeah, United, United Nations. Nations. Yes. Yeah, this isn't like some random association that you found under a rock. Like this is kind of a <laughs> deal. So, what, so yeah. how did that happen? What was and that not like? to date myself, but that was uh, that was seven years ago, and when I was under thirty, <laughs> and uh, that was that felt good. But no, yeah, it was the United Nations. It was um, uh, a group of entrepreneurs. We were all recognized uh, at the UN for our work in the online space, and so I was about two years into my business at the time. So it was wow. a big deal for me to have gone from like. And nobody uh, starting out from nothing to two years down the road being at the UN with some amazing people and being recognized. And it was, it was awesome. But yeah. Wow. What that's so exciting. So did you like, did you like fly out there like live to yeah, accept the reward? We flew to New York. It was actually at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Um, wow. So it was very impressive. We got to sit in the big room where all the heads of states usually sit. And we had our, you know, the, you know, little plaque with the name of our company. It was very, <laughs> very official, but also very fun. <laughs> Heck yeah. Wow. That's, yeah, so, yeah, that's cool. so cool. Only two years yeah. in too. Like two what do you, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, what do you, th- what, what happened in those two years to make that possible? Do you think? That's a good question. Um, a lot of things happened very quickly, but uh, about a six, six to eight months into my business, I started to realize that I needed to put myself out there and associate myself with a more powerful brand that would give me credibility because Mm -hmm. before that I hadn't, you know, built an audience. I was not in the online space. I worked in the corporate world. I was a marketing manager. And then I came out and I was like, okay, I'm building a business. I'm going to make PowerPoints for a living. (laughs) It didn't even make sense to most people that I talked to. So I was like, I need credibility where do I get credibility? And the first place I could think of because I was in the presentation design world was naturally TED, right? So uh, TED Talks. And I was living in Miami at the time. And I found out that there was a TEDx Miami happening about four weeks down the road. And uh, and they were looking for, you know, sponsors and people that wanted to donate and volunteer their time. And I thought, okay, four weeks. I mean, that's happening like tomorrow. There's no way like they would need presentation design help at this point. I thought about it for about 24, 48 hours. And I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to send an email and see if, you know, maybe they're looking for some help. And I sent this very thoughtful email. I actually took a TED talk from a couple of years before that, from a TEDx Miami talk, uh, where the, the speaker, the guy was just brilliant, super magnetic. Uh, had an amazing presence online. 
had really crappy slides behind him, like really crappy, not at all like up to standard with his speech. And so I literally took screenshots of this guy's YouTube video and I photoshopped in my version of what his visuals should have looked like. <laughs> oh, hell God. yeah. That is brilliant. I don't Whoa. know if that speaks to of my brilliance or I had way too much time on my hands at the time. <laughs> well, it matters. Yeah. So. Wow. When you're uh, broke and just starting out your business, you have a lot of free time. Um, so that's what I did. Yeah. Literally 45 minutes after I hit send, uh, I got an email back from the, the you know, head organizer. And they were like, literally, the email said, uh, where have you been? <laughs> we need your wow. help ASAP. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. They, they, they actually need me. Okay, great. And so literally the next day I was on a call um, with the team. And they set me up with three of the speakers to help them with their visuals. I got to create these beautiful artistic presentations. Uh, you know, they were displayed on giant screen, uh, you know, at the, the venue where this was uh, held. And so I got to brag about it on social media. And, I, you know, I had uh, a Twitter account at the time with maybe 100 followers. I had a Facebook account with just my friends, uh, you know, Instagram. And so I just posted everywhere that I could about the fact that I just designed these beautiful, you know, TEDx slides. And so I kept doing that. At the same time, I was also creating, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of SlideShare. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Much, okay. yeah, yeah. It's kind of died out now, but uh, back, back in 2013, 14, it was really the place to be. And so you had a lot of presentation designers showcasing their work there. I was doing that. I was putting out presentations, super original, super colorful, and that was getting traction. I was uh, 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 selected as presentation of the day several times, which meant they put me on the homepage of the website, which at the time got millions and millions of you know views of traffic every day. So that sent a lot of traffic my way. And I was bragging about that to my 100 Twitter followers that never liked or retweeted anything that I did. So I just, kept, you know, I'm like, this is what I'm doing, you know, Put it out there. <laughs> Lo and behold, there was a uh, lady following me on Twitter, one of my 100 followers, who happened to work for Fast Company. And she had actually been following what I did with Ted, what I was doing on SlideShare. Uh, she checked out my website. And one day I get, you know, a tweet uh, from somebody who's, you know, asking me if I'd be interested in being interviewed for Fast Company. Wow. And my immediate uh, thought was I texted all my friends. And I was like, who is messing with me? It's not cool. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it. Like, group chat. <laughs> yeah, like this person from Fast Company is interested in, you know, my, you know, artistic PowerPoints. It just didn't make sense to me. And so as it turns out, she was real. And uh, about two weeks later, she flew down with her uh, camera crew to Miami and they interviewed me. <laughs> it was Holy completely crap. surreal. Uh, this so is, epic. <laughs> yeah, this is like eight, eight, nine months into the business. So. Things happen very fast. And then once that uh, interview was published, my phone started ringing off the hook and it was the dream clients like Disney World was calling, you know, Liberty Mutual, like the, you know, the big companies, but also some of the most famous speakers in their niches, like, you know, uh, uh, professional speakers were reaching out to me. People were emailing my name and spreading the word about my work to the, um, what is that association called? The something speakers association national speakers, national speakers association yeah, and NSA. Exactly. Yeah. yeah they have this newsletter and a couple of people mentioned my name in the nsa newsletter and so all of a sudden flood of clients flood of business and then all of a sudden i was legit and so that's how the un thing you know happened after that is people were i guess the people that were impressed with what i was doing <laughs> Good for you. What a wow. lesson in just putting it out there. You know, yeah. I know. Being relentless with it. And it all started too with that really personalized outreach. We're not here to talk about outreach. We've beaten this horse many times. I hope you take a lesson from that, listeners. Like that, that's where it started. And then you just put it all out there, kept making noise about it, marketed the heck out of it. Yep. And even man, when I thought nobody made was it happen. Listening. That's because right. That's the just, important piece. Mm -hmm. You just don't know where your luck's going to come from. So you got to keep, you know, creating opportunities for yourself. Yeah, that was my oh, lesson. 
This is like one of my favorite entrepreneurial stories of all time. I am so inspired by you. <laughs> it's so cool. I mean, like you really nail down a niche here. There's because you're right. Like this is this is like a trope at this point, especially in the the spaces that Taylor and I spend our time in, right? With these yeah. with professional speakers, like amazing from the stage, horrible visuals to go along with it. Like it's a tale yeah. as old as time. And so you're really solving a true problem that people have. And like yeah. it, it's just maybe you did it in a way that other people hadn't, or maybe you were talking about it in a way that other people hadn't. Like I'm not smart enough to know exactly what it was that caught that lit the fire, but God damn, yeah. it, that fire got lit. Because, wow, I mean, yeah. it, it went, you went zero to hero pretty fast, Nadine. That's I did, impressive. yeah. Very, I, was, I was very grateful for what was happening to me. Um, and uh, yes, what you're right. Like I was solving a problem. I didn't even realize how big of a problem I was solving. Because I did not go out to solve a problem. I went out to do something that was fun for me. And what was Heck fun yeah. for me was designing in PowerPoint. And so... If you guys want to hear the story of why I ended up even designing in PowerPoint, because I don't know if I mentioned this. Lay it on us. I, I'm not a, I'm a self-taught designer. I've never set foot in a design school. I'm absolutely not like formally trained in design whatsoever, which is the reason why I don't know how to use Photoshop in design or any of those fancy tools. <laughs> uh, I only know how to use one design goal, tool called PowerPoint. And, uh, and that's because uh, when I was a marketing manager in my last corporate job, uh, my, my boss came up to me and she was like, Hey, we need more help with design stuff. Like, would you be interested in, uh, taking a, a training and, uh, you know, becoming a little bit more, uh, advanced in design so you can do some work for us. And I was like, sure. So they paid for, uh, I don't know if you guys remember lynda.com before it was purchased yeah. by LinkedIn. Yeah. I don't, I don't oh, even yeah. know if it still exists. Um, but, uh, she was like one of the first people that did like on legit online courses. So they paid for me to take this lynda.com course that was like Photoshop 101 or something. Um, I got, I logged on, I opened the course and it was like 17 hours of video, something like, like total. <laughs> so I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to learn. I'm going to have to watch 17 hours of video to learn Photoshop. That freaked me out. I started watching video number one and about three, four minutes into it, I was like, screw this, <laughs> not happening. There's yeah. no way I'm going to watch 17 more hours of this shit. Sorry. Can I say that? Yeah, of <laughs> course. We got the explicit label. Welcome. Uh, so I was just, I was over it before I even started. And so, but my company still needed me to learn freaking design. So I was like, so I started perusing uh, uh, lynda.com and I found like, you know, uh, design 101 courses. And so I just started learning design. I was like, screw Photoshop. I don't need Photoshop. I'm going to learn design. And I learned design through these videos. And then I was like, wait a minute, I can do all this stuff that they're showing me in Photoshop in PowerPoint. And so I hacked PowerPoint to make it do things that people don't usually, you know, do with it. I would change the size of the canvas. Like, when you open up PowerPoint, it gives you a slide size, you know, canvas, but you can change that, that uh, to a square or a bigger, you know, rectangle or whatever. And then you can design anything you want within that canvas. And so that's what I started doing and practicing my design skills. And then I just got really, really good at PowerPoint. And I started creating everything that the company needed me to create in PowerPoint. They had no idea at first. They thought I was doing, you know, <laughs> I was saying <laughs> everything. I created their slide decks in PowerPoint, of course, but also their brochures and, wow. you know, marketing materials and one pagers for the sales team. And anytime anybody on the team needed anything graphic, they would come to me. I even built stuff for websites in PowerPoint. And so after a while, I was like, wait a second, I think I'm on to something here. Like, you know, like I could do what I'm doing for this company or other companies and be my own boss. And it's fun for me. And so that's really how I got into it. I was like, I didn't go thinking, you know, there are a lot of speakers out there who have really bad slides <laughs> and I can help them. No, I was like, this is fun. I want to do more of this. <laughs> and wow, I want other for people to pay me for it. <laughs> yeah, hey, for sure. That's how it's done. Passion. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So this wow. eventually segued into more than PowerPoint, like branding as well, right? You identified this kind of branding gap. And I know one of your companies, We Are Visual, has mm -hmm. a pretty pretty interesting story behind why you named it that. So yeah. if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd love for you to tell that story to to our audience. Of why it's called We Are Visual? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, 
first of all, there were all the all the, the genius names that I came up with were taken. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's where you start for sure. That's where so you that start. Was, yeah. that was Very like, good branding. Dot com. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, that one was taken. That one was taken. Uh, <laughs> as it turns out, none of my initial ideas were uh, original at all, and this was just me racking my brain, and I was like, all right what am I doing here? I'm helping people communicate ideas, how to communicate ideas through visuals. Why are, you know, because we are visual. And I was like, we are visual. We are visual. We are visual beings. Like this is as old as the dawn of time is we are visual beings. We recognize threats visually, you know, like a tiger coming for us or any other threat coming for us. We recognize it visually. We react viscerally to our visual environment it's just ingrained in us and so it is it it was relevant back then when we were being chased by you know lions it's also relevant now because we are being bombarded with visual information more than ever before and so the way that we now interact with the world is visual beyond the fact that we do judge a a book by its cover right like who doesn't? That's why so much money is spent into cover design. Sometimes the cover design is way better than the book, right? And we get screwed. But uh, but we really judge everything by by its cover. And when we are bombarded with so much information, we have to select what we are going to give our attention to by what attracts our eye. So it's whatever is going to be the best at attracting us visually that is going to catch our attention the longest. And, and that's when you can communicate your ideas and, you know, and so if you want to be, uh, if you want to communicate effectively in today's world, you need to be able to communicate visually. And so all of that, I was like, all right, this is a fact. This is a very strong thing that I can anchor myself into is we are visual. And I was like, well, why can't that be the name of my company? And that, that's, yeah. that's how it came up. Yeah. Wow. Really tapping into human psychology there. I'm a big fan. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it makes sense too. Like that's the world that we live in right now. Walk into any supermarket and you're going to see a bunch of very bright, loud colors from yeah. every direction trying to catch your attention. In fact, yeah. I imagine to some degree as a designer, that's got to be difficult because you're not just using the core principles of how to attract attention with color, let's say, as this novice is trying to explain to the expert here. But like yeah. I imagine you're also having to try to stand out from all the other people that are doing the exact same thing, right? Is yeah. that something that you run into is standing out from the people that are also trying to stand out? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 100%, which is, uh, by the way, a mistake that I see a lot of people making is they they uh, don't think outside the box. You know, if they they literally box themselves into whatever niche they are, they're in. So whatever industry they're in, they will look at what their competitors are doing and they will do something similar, which by the way, is a valid way of doing things. Because if you want your audience to associate you with, oh, you do this type of work, then yeah, that's effective. But if you want to stand out in the sea of people doing the same stuff, um, that's not going to work. And so this is where I encourage people to go against the grain and actually flip the status quo and do something that is unseen in their specific niche. And uh, I call this process, and it's just my, my, my word for it, I like cross-pollination. So I will go, if you're in like the financial industry, for example, I may encourage you to go find inspiration in maybe the beauty industry. See somebody, like what they're doing and copy maybe their color scheme. And so when you take inspiration and then maybe take inspiration from that and then another industry and then cross them together and see what that gives you. And that's what allows you to really come up with, you know, more creative, original visual identities that are definitely not going to be seen in your, you know, in your niche. Wow. That wow that's that idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I mean, cool. Just, that way you're not copying everybody in like your core industry. You're just, yeah. it, it's almost hard not to be unique at that point. If you're not looking at the, the core industry and then copying those visual yeah. identities, that's cool. Yeah. There's a book by um, Austin Kleon. I don't know if you guys know him called uh, oh. Steal Like an Artist. Brilliant. It's a <laughs> tiny book. Uh, you can read it in probably 30 minutes. It's very visual. It's got lots of pictures. Highly recommend it. Um, but in the book, he explains that when you, that being creative is really, you're never inventing anything. 
And that this is something where a lot of people get hung up. They think they're good, you know, they need to invent something new that's never been done. Guess what? It's probably been done at some point. <laughs> and oh, yeah. there's no way you can invent something new. And so creativity is not about inventing something new. It's about taking inspiration from this person and this person and this person and taking random things from random people and bringing them together to create something unique. And so he, he explains in the book, if you copy from one person, that's plagiarism. <laughs> if you copy <laughs> from two people, it's creativity. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's so great. So if you oh, need to man. be creative, uh, or if you want to be more creative, the first place to start is to get more inspiration, is to widen your horizons and look at what different people are doing in completely different spaces than yours. That's how you become creative. You don't go to school for it. You don't read. You explore. Oh, oh my gosh. That. Curiosity this... component is huge. Yep. Mm -hmm. For sure. Oh, I'm such a fan of the way that you think. <laughs> Thank you. So I... Uh... <laughs> We get this all the time, especially like in the world of speaking, right? These are personal brands, solopreneurs, mm -hmm. and the emphasis is on the personal brand a lot of the time, right? And so the thing that we'll get a lot is like, I just need a logo. I don't need a brand. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think you have some opinions about this. I do. I I'd have love for strong, you to share those opinions. <laughs> very strong opinions about that. Uh, so I can't even tell you the amount of uh, situations I've been where... <clears throat> As the person, well, so you have your branding and they're like, oh yeah, I'm like, okay, what do you have? I have a logo, I have colors, I have fonts, I have a website. And I'm like, great, where's the rest of it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? That That's my branding. I'm like, no, that's not. That's the begin, that's the tip of the iceberg of your branding. That's the basics of what you need to actually build your branding. Your branding is going to have to incorporate everything that you do across every platform and at every touch point that you have with your audience. So what does that look like? It is everything from the, the project proposal that you send to the invoice, to your social media, to um, your media kit or your speaker kit, to your slides. And all of that needs to be cohesive with your website and those colors and fonts that you have and your logo. And so brand cohesiveness and having, you know, your stuff look the same everywhere is something that a lot of people struggle with for very simple reasons sometimes. Like, for example, you will hire a professional, probably pay them a lot of money, to build you this super fancy website, this super sleek logo, right? They give you a style guide with your colors and fonts. You're like, all right, I'm set. And now you have a speaking gig and you have to make slides. Are your slides going to look like that fancy website that you paid $10,000 for? No, because you're going to make those slides yourself. And you're probably not going to know how to use those fonts that your designer gave you or how to marry those colors that the designer gave you. And so your slides are going to look like crap compared to <laughs> your website. <laughs> I'm just being Spitting real. Truth over Stick there. it to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We are honest on this show. <laughs> and so I, so here's the deal. Um, I'm going to say something very blunt. It's the, the standard in the speaking world, the standards in the speaking world are so freaking low in terms of visual quality that if you just make a slight freaking effort to make it a little bit better, you're already going to stand out. You're already going to be seen differently, right? So it doesn't take that much to actually stand out in the speaking world um, by making better better looking slides, more professional looking slides. Uh, and I want to circle back to something that you, uh, you know, mentioned earlier about like, what is it that I did that was so unique? Well, what I did is I, I, I rewrote the, the PowerPoint playbook. When I open PowerPoint, I don't put it anything into the boxes that they give me. I delete those boxes, those placeholders. I delete all of that. And I start painting. I start painting visual stories, literally like an artist on a canvas. Like if you look at the slides and the way that they, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, sequence together. It's a visual story. And that's what I did differently. And um, I wrote a book called Slide Therapy, where I explained my method for how to do that to, you know, to speakers, to anybody really that makes presentations for a living, mostly speakers. 
uh, so that they can, instead of, you know, following the, 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 the PowerPoint playbook and putting text into the boxes that they give you and making these very boxy slides, creating visual stories, incorporating more imagery, incorporating colors, playing with fonts and, and type and doing, you know, more original things. So um, I don't know where I was going with that thought. (laughs) 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 But, uh, but yeah, that is, that is what I teach people is, you know, is a different way of doing uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. For sure. Well, to your point earlier that people put themselves in boxes, right? I think some of what you were just explaining elucidates that idea that you should really be thinking outside of the box, do things differently than the way that either it's prescripted that you do them or the way that other people do them because that little bit of extra effort makes you stand out. And we know, especially as a speaker, one of the most important things you should be considering is how you're going to make yourself stand out because otherwise you're probably not going to get a whole lot of business. you got to break some rules. And I just remembered a story from a client of mine who is an, uh, I hope I don't mess this up, audiologist. Anyway, she's a doctor who helps people with their hearing. Okay. (laughs) I think that's what it's called. And she was going to be speaking at this very prestigious conference for audiologists. And she came to me uh, because she wanted help creating her slides. And they gave her a template, by the way. You know, like conferences, and I'm sure a lot of speakers here who are listening to us are going to recognize the fact that a lot of conferences will give you templates to, you know, build your slides into And uh, they will kind of force you to do it, but you don't really have to do it. They just want to give you a container so that you don't give them something really crappy. Um, But I encouraged my clients to not use their template. And I say, be very firm. Tell them that you're going to have your slides professionally done and you're not going to use their template. And she was like, okay, that was really hard for her to do. And then the second thing I told her is, we're going to make your slides super colorful. And she was like, well, I'm going to be speaking to doctors. I'm like, exactly. Doctors are boring. (laughs) All the other (laughs) presentations are going to be boring. You're going to come in with this super colorful presentation, and I guarantee you, you're going to stand out. And she was like, okay, hard pill to swallow. All right, I'll follow you, Nadine. Then we started putting together her color palette, and I slapped pink into her color palette. Pink. And wow. yellow and blue, but pink. She was like, Nadine, I can't put pink on my slides at this freaking prestigious doctor's conference. And I was like, yes, you can. And yes, you will. And watch, just trust me. And so it was really hard for her. She, she, she was great. She really played, played along and trusted me. We created her slides. She went and did her presentation. She was the talk of the town at that uh, conference. Everyone was Obviously. talking about her. Everyone, you know, wanted to to talk to her afterwards. Obviously, people were asking her about her slides, but people just thought she was brilliant because her presentation was so original. Now, to be fair, her content was freaking amazing, which is why I insisted on actually making her visuals super original so that they would elevate and match what she was sharing because what she was sharing was brilliant. And it would have been a shame for that to be, you know, undersold with, with poor visuals. But... She was a talk of the town. They wrote about her and, you know, and then they interviewed her and like her name uh, was being spoken all over. And she came back to me and she was like, you're right. <laughs> it works. Standing like, out. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So that's wow. You're very authoritative. Good for you for putting your yeah. foot down. You're like, We're doing expert. it this way. Guiding yep. people to their success. Mm-hmm. That's how it's done for sure. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So you have, we are visual, but then you created the digital brand kit or yes. branding kit. Yeah. Digital brand kit. So, yes. and it, because I would, I would imagine like it, it's difficult. It could be difficult or unattainable for some people to like hire a professional to do their brand and their slides all the time. Right. And you saw a gap for maybe the DIYer to still have an elevated visual identity. And so this thing got created. So tell us more about that and, you know, what's involved with it. Yeah. So it came really from a a demand that I was getting from a lot of my speaker clients, a a lot of my clients in general, but uh, mostly speakers because they have personal brands. Right. And so they, they need other assets besides the presentations that I'm making for them. So what would happen is because a lot of my clients would come to me with usually either no visual identity or very poor visual identity, I would end up creating a custom visual identity for their presentation. 
And they would love that so much that they would want to then incorporate it into everything else. And so they'd ask me, well, can you give me a logo that looks like this? And can you give me, you know, uh, PDFs and stuff that I could create that look like the presentation? And from the demands that I was getting, I was like, all right, wait a second. I think people need more than what I'm giving them. They need more than just beautiful presentations. They need beautiful branding across everything that they do. Uh, and so that kind of started me going on the idea. And then the other thing is I was realizing that people were going to two, falling into two buckets. Either they were DIYing because they wanted to save the money and they were having a really hard time DIYing because they, you know, they could not create, uh, uh graphics that were, you know, professional looking, et cetera. Or even worse, they would go and dump a lot of money into having stuff custom designed. And they usually would work with different designers. And so it, their stuff still didn't look cohesive. And I just wasn't finding like a solution that was across the board helping people um, that was affordable, but also gave them good quality stuff. And so that's how Digital Brand Kit came up. I was like, all right. Initially, I just created templates for presentations. So here's, you know, uh, templates to, to create keynotes and workshops. Here's templates to create your courses, like slides for your courses. And then it was slides for your webinars. Initially, it was called slides that convert. <laughs> it was just nice. slides. And that's well, all I knew how to do at the time. And I was like, I'm just going to go into this thing that I do really well. So it's called slides that convert. And I, I beta launched it. And the feedback was, give me more stuff. Like, I love this. Give me more. I want more than slides. I was like, oh, okay, shoot. So then I just started interviewing people and asking, what else do you need for your business? And they're like, well, I'm launching a podcast. I need uh, graphics for my podcast, like, you know, the, the, the squares to, to brand it and then the social media graphics to market it, et cetera. I was like, all right. So I created that and then video stuff and then social media stuff. And then, oh, I need a media kit. Oh, I need a speaker kit. Oh, I need this. I need that sales. And so I just surveyed people and put together like, is actually what makes up your branding and uh, what it is it's it's 12 kits right so 12 kits across everything that you do in your in your business and that covers uh, pretty much everything every brand asset that your business truly needs and the thing that I realized is that most people don't actually know what they need right so we were talking about how people think their branding is colors fonts logo website tip of the iceberg well the rest of that iceberg is these 12 kits that are created. It's all of these other things that you need. And so there is a design kit, which has all of your design basics, style guide, logo, all of that. But then you also have a course kit, everything that you need to build a course, not just the slides, the worksheets, the, the roadmaps, the social media graphics to market it, um, you know, all of that. And then you have your webinar kit. And then, so everything you need to build a webinar. And by the way, what I realize is people don't just want pretty graphics and pretty templates that are just visually pleasing. They need help with the strategy of like, well, what do I say in the webinar? Add how do order, I start right? it? Right. Uh, how, you know, how do I do the pitch and what's the format? And so the templates I created were not just these beautiful graphics, which they are, but they're also infused with the strategy. So it'll tell you exactly like, what to include in your webinar, how to start it, and what order to have the information. And the slides are actually given to you in the exact order that you need them with <laughs> directions. Like it's it's like idiot proof. <laughs> it's directions yeah. to, you know, like do this, say this. And it has copy prompts in it. So you don't even need to try and not come up with copy. It'll give you ideas for what each slide should say. And what I realized is people have a hard time with the implementation part, right? They yeah. might get the strategy and the conceptual, but when it comes to the rubber hits the road and you actually have to make things happen, happen, this is where procrastination sets in because it feels hard, you know, like, oh, I need to think about this and I need to figure out this part. And so people kind of like uh, stay stuck. And I met so many people that stayed stuck on the idea of creating, uh, launching a course because not only because they couldn't create the course, but because they couldn't create the webinar to sell the course. And so they have this idea that just stays in their mind and that they never actually execute on because they couldn't get past the, you know, the starting line. And so these are the templates that I created, uh, even though initially I just started out to make really, really beautiful branding, uh, I ended up creating what I call branded implementation tools. 
tools that actually help you get shit done, you know, like actually implement your ideas, execute on your ideas and bonus cherry on top. Your stuff is going to look really good and professional. And that's just a bonus, but it's also going to be built very intelligently and actually be uh, effective and convert. So man, what I love about this is how much you've productized it, you know, like every you've answered every question people have. It's not just the pretty stuff, but it's also the implementation of it. Like it's it's just it's clear that this is a culmination of many years of demands from clients about what they need and gaps that you're filling. And you just created a product that answers all of their questions and makes it all happen, which is I mean, hats off to you. Very few are able to get to a, a product at that level. So thank um, you. Yeah. Okay, this is textbook. So, yeah, textbook. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Leading to the very beginning. I'm learning of from you. I hope you guys, I'm learning I, yeah, from I hope you, you guys, in a big way. I hope we're taking notes, right? Like, listener, like not only just the branding stuff, like that's that's valuable, but the yeah. journey, right? That exactly. Nadine has been on as her own business owner. We all have the ability to do this type of thing. So I hope you're looking at the meta level of this conversation. Okay, so golden nugget time. What is one thing people can do right now to elevate their visual identity? Hmm. Great question. Guess what? It has nothing to do with your visual identity. Whoa. Um, oh, plot twist. Ooh, curveball. Love it. Let's All go. Right. I'm excited. Your visual identity is actually an inside job. You have to start on the inside. And this is why a lot of people are frustrated with the design process because they jump a very important phase and go straight into picking out colors and designs and fonts. And no, we're not there yet. Slow down, come back to the basics because branding and visual identity is about energy, right? I I, trying to coin this term. Maybe I will after saying it enough time, but it's the energetics of branding, right? So before you go out and try to figure out what your visual identity is, you first need to figure out what your brand energy is, right? So who you are, as a person, and so, and this is speaking uh, specifically to personal brands, this doesn't really apply to corporate brands, but if you're a personal brand, you are the face of your business. Your brand energy is what you communicate to people, um, the feelings that you make them feel, what you, what they come to you for, right? That's, that's your brand energy. There's a quote by um, Jeff Bezos that says, your brand is what people say about you when you leave the room, right? Well, I say your visual identity is how you communicate your personality and your energy and what makes you unique without ever being in the same room with someone, right? And so uh, your visual identity is your handshake. It's how people are going to experience you virtually and digitally before they experience you in real life. And so you've got to be able to communicate who you are without being there. And that's what your visual identity is going to do. And so you can't go build your visual identity if you don't know what that visual identity is supposed to communicate, right? So you need to come back and do that inside work first of who am I? How do I want people to perceive me? Who do I want to attract? That's like the most important part that a lot of people skip is, you know, like target audience, ICA, everyone's talking about these fancy words. Just who are you trying to attract? Who are your people? And what do you need to communicate to them in order to become magnetic for them? And so once you've answered all those questions, that's when we can start talking about colors and fonts and all those other things, right? And uh, I'm actually developing a new color picking system uh, using a blind test because after many years of doing this and realizing uh, that this is a big pitfall for people, they they don't know how to pick the colors that are going to, you know, work for their branding. And so I am developing a color workshop, which I'll be launching soon, but it's, it's a system that I created that walks you through a step-by-step process that starts with a blind test. And the blind test is I'm going to give you a bunch of cards and they're color cards, right? With the meaning of each color, the symbolism of each color in words, right? And words that can um, trigger an emotion, right? Words that you can either connect with or not connect with. But the trick is, is the color cards don't have color on them, right? They're all black and white. So you have to choose the words. What words actually speak to you, right? And so you go through this process of elimination, like, all right, these, these 
um, you know, clusters of words don't really speak to me. You delete, delete, delete. And then you'll end up with between one and three where you're like, all right, these words really represent who I am. And then you uncover the cards and it'll tell you what those colors are. And that's an effective way to make sure that you pick colors without actually what knowing what colors are, what those colors are and being distracted by whatever preconceptions you may have about those colors, right? Those are your true colors because they represent your true energy. And, uh, and so this is what I've had to come up with to help my clients, um, you know, pick the right colors for them because it's such a difficult process because so many people carry, um, symbolism from other things that they've seen other ways that they've seen those people use those colors then they may carry it into you know that decision making process and maybe pollute the whole process so you need to clear your mind of forget what everyone else is doing who are you what do you want to communicate and then we'll help you figure out what colors what color combination you need to use in order to communicate those exact values that exact energy to people